Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, we'll wait for everybody to join in for a couple of minutes, and then we'll start a webinar. Right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I welcome you all to the Learn How to Harness the Power of Your Multidisciplinary Team webinar. I am Amanda, and I will be moderating today's session. Working in a multidisciplinary team can be a complex process where people with different expertise, knowledge, and skills work together as a team, aiming towards one outcome. Through this webinar, Various challenges along with best practices to overcome them will be discussed. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the support of Department of Science and Technology and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. I would also like to acknowledge the support of the sponsors and affiliates of Solar Decathlon India. Today, we have with us Ashok Lal, Ashok Lal graduated from University of Cambridge, UK in architecture and fine arts and obtained the Architectural Association Diploma in 1970. His architectural firm is committed to an architectural practice based on principles of environmental sustainability and social responsibility. The firm has won a number of awards and its work has been published widely. Engaged in architectural education since 1990, he has developed curricula and teaching methods to address environmental issues. He has published many articles and presented papers on environmental sustainable design and has been an active member of institutions and group promoting awareness and building competence in sustainable design of buildings. To all the participants, please feel free free to send in your questions anytime during the session and we will take them up at the end one by one. So now over to you, Ashok. Thank you, Amanda. And welcome all of you, the people who have taken on this challenge to participate in the second round of the Decathlon. As Amanda said, integrated design with a multidisciplinary team at the student level is, is, is quite a challenge. It's something that many of us will be facing for the first time. And so what I'm going to try and do is to share with you a few things that we have learned along the way in trying to work out this method of integrated design. I'm reflecting really on our professional experience as a, as, a, as a professional consultancy team. Uh, we are an architectural firm, but we work with a lot of other people when we come to complex designs. So here's an example 
of what integrated design involves. Um, on the one side, you'll see in this kind of rough Venn diagram, uh, there is the climate and environmental comfort aspects of building design. There's what's outside and integrated sometimes in the, in the building, which is the landscape and the surrounding biophilia and microclimate. Um, there is the issue of embodied energy. There's the issue of using what we call passive strategies in the way we fashion the building's components and its fabric. We also have to worry about uh, making a building economical, compact, efficient. Uh, we have to select equipment, which is uh, electromechanical equipment, which is also efficient. And we also have to look at the water side of things, which is part of your challenge. And so there is a large number of uh, different aspects of building design that need to be brought together through this process of integration. And for that, you need to set up a kind of a team. And so this is for one particular project. We as architects were team leaders, so-called, I would say, but we had somebody who belongs to the city where the building is going to be built, um, and somebody who is an expert in environmental certification, and also in, in passive design strategies, analysis of it. Swati from Terra Viridis. We also had a, a mechanical and electrical and plumbing consultant. We had somebody who specialized in energy systems integration. Then as a subset of that, there is a specialist in simulation. We also have a person who is expert in landscape design. And of course, there's a structural designer. And on top of this all, there's somebody who understands the impact of the use of materials, uh, the carbon dioxide emissions in the use of materials, somebody who knows about embodied energy in materials. So this was the, this was the team. And Beside this, you have the client who has a budget, who has a time frame, who has certain expectations of processes that must be managed. They're also part of our multidisciplinary team. Next, Amanda. Now, if we look at the design team, the people who are coming together like your group, you'll probably find that there are three sets of skills involved here. That people who have come from an architectural background would probably have fairly good what we call spatial skills. Skills of organizing three-dimensional space and object. How big, how small, in what relationship one to the other, how you utilize the area that is available to you, etc. The disposition of space is a is a skill that is developed with a lot of practice. And this is what the architects are able to work out. And they are using these skills in order to answer many of the issues that are represented by the Venn diagram on the left-hand side. Then you have other experts like the engineers and scientists who have computing skills and analytical skills, especially understanding things quantitatively, being able to calculate the quantitative impact of different kinds of spatial arrangements, for instance, or use of materials for that matter, and so on and so forth. So you get different kinds of skills that are brought together. The question that now arises is, how you make these skills actually come together into a creative process? Next. Well, this diagram kind of tries to summarize the idea. What we are looking for is a way in which the analytical skills, the computing skills, and the spatial skills, with all the team, which is listed here in the middle, can overlap and find their common language and their common ground across two sets of disciplines, or across all three sets of disciplines. And this is the, this is, let's say it's a symbolic diagram that shows what the intent of this process is. Next.
Well, whenever you have a team, um, there is something called core values, which are shared by the team, intention, which is often an individualistic thing, but also a team thing. There's also the motivation. Now let's not forget that when we come together for the first time, each one of us has our own personal history. We, let us say we are all coming from different places, from different trajectories, so to speak. And each one of us has some fundamental values that we really think are important for us. Each one of us has come, with a, come into this exercise with a particular kind of intention. Each one of us has come to this exercise with our own motivation. We've done it voluntarily. We've not been pushed into it, okay? Now you can see how these things, core values, intention and motivation are, you know, we've got the example of our Olympian athletes who have done wonders in the Tokyo games. You can see their example. My gosh, how concentrated they are on what they're, what they, where they have to reach. And what is the depth of work that has been put in to reach that goal that they are after? So these are, these are individual traits, right? Which then have to be brought together. Let's look at the next slide. Well, when you have a team, it's a different thing, right? You, each one has their core values, each one has their intention, each one has their motivation, but there has to be some magic, some chemistry in the team that can bring it all together. And we assume generally that there is a role for some sort of leadership here. There has to be one or two characters who who know how to galvanize all these core values, intentions, and motivations into the working together of a team. Of course, we are looking at a cricket team that did brilliantly in the last test, but this test, they failed miserably. But interestingly, the captain says, this has not demoralized us. We're going to continue. And we're going to continue to work hard. We're going to share our values. We're going to align our intentions and we're going to be all motivating each other all the time. And this, you might say, is, is a metaphor for our design team too. Next. So, I've got to move this fellow around, yeah. So as you can see, that it's quite important that at the very beginning, when we all come together to do something uh, which requires teamwork, we need to have core objectives. And in this case, for this particular project, the core objectives of this proposal are fourfold. They are to demonstrate a net zero carbon and environmentally sensitive integrated building design solution for contemporary workspaces in India. This is really trying to write a sentence which kind of sums up what is the core objective. And all of us as a team must understand these things very clearly. This is quite important. Next one is to develop a design solution that is inherently economical and whose principles of design are replicable for its climatic region. So these projects in the decathlon that will succeed right, through this competitive process are intended to be such that they can make a difference in the market at large. They will make a difference in the market at large, in the market at large if they are inherently, they have good economic sense. They're inherently economical. People pick it up because it, it works for them. Financially, money-wise, it works for them. And whatever the solution, it has to be such 
that it could be used in many circumstances. It cannot be something which is suited only for one situation, only for one kind of building, only for one place, right? It has to be replicable. It's when, ha it ha when it has these two kinds of properties, then it is likely to be a market changer. The next one is that the design, the, uh, to demonstrate design strategies that are robust and resilient to meet the challenges of rising temperatures and extreme events due to climate change. Actually, in one sense, this is a very fundamental statement because all of this exercise has arisen. The need for going into the decathlon is because we have to respond to the fact of climate change. It means that the team must understand what is this climate change. The team must understand why we need to respond to it. And that the solution of response to climate change must be robust, it must be tough, it should be workable, and it should be resilient. It should be something that can adjust itself to different kinds of challenges as you meet, uh, as you try and mitigate climate change. Very important aspect. And if you're a designer, or designer of anything today in this world. The design has to offer the holistic experience of a workplace or any other kind of place, depending on what kind of project you're picking up, that ensures high environmental standards, as well as a culture of building that mitigates climate change. Let me explain a couple of things here. What do we mean by holistic experience? Well, imagine yourself living and working in a place, let's say for, for a one whole year, living through the season, seasonal cycles and working hard, living at, and working at a place for one whole year. You don't really count and watch very carefully all the aspects that have affected your being there, your productivity, your energy, your feeling of well-being, you don't really count each of those very carefully. But overall, all aspects of the place where you're working or living have an impact on you. And that is a complete holistic experience, whether it is aesthetic, whether it is just physical comfort, convenience, taking care of all the practical needs, the fact that you don't have to stress yourself out, all of this amounts to a complete experience. And we're also talking about maintaining what we call high environmental standards because it is believed that when you have clean air, clean water, comfortable temperatures, comfortable lighting, you feel well. There's a feeling of well being. You have to have high environmental standards, that's part of holistic experience. Now, these, the design is also saying that once you experience this building, you will develop a culture which says, you know, this is the way to design and to live and use, to live in and use such buildings. Let me give you a very small example. If a building is designed, with nice openable windows. The idea is that you'll open the windows when it is pleasant outside, in the evenings, early mornings, and when the weather is pleasant, you'd open them so that you don't have to do any air conditioning, right? Because that will then mitigate climate change. But it takes a certain kind of person and a certain kind of building to develop that culture where you know that to enjoy this place, while mitigating climate change, while enjoying high environmental standards, while experiencing the totality of the annual feelings that you'll get in living and working in that building, there's a certain way of living in that building. A building is designed for that way of living. That is meant by the culture of building. It's an important point, worth thinking about. Next. Okay, next question always, you know, what makes a team? Um, it's a good word, a team is a really good word because team stands for 
collaboration, cooperation, and a competitive spirit when it comes to saying, you know, we as a team are going to be doing better than ourselves in the past and better than the others whose performance we know, right? So self-improvement in relation to perceived performance of the rest of the world, that's your challenge. So you have to develop that spirit, you know. Sometimes people call it, what is it the, killing, the killer instinct. I think that's a negative term. Shouldn't use the term killer instinct. You should say healthy competition. That's what Olympics is all about, healthy competition. But as a team, you have to be mutually supportive. Cooperation means when somebody needs your help, you are there. Collaboration means if you need to do something together, by coming together, you're able to do something which you cannot do individually. That's collaboration. Uh, these are important attitudes that need to be developed when you're going to work as a team. And you know, it's, I think at the beginning, it's a very good idea to just sit together, go over these terms, talk about these terms, talk to each other, let everyone state their motivation, let everyone state their, uh, their core values, let everyone redefine their objectives or the objectives of this exercise and come together as a cooperative and a collaborative team with a strong competitive spirit. Next. Well, to become a collaborator, to become a, someone who, uh, who can work with others, all right, you need certain kinds of personal attitudes. And I have caught myself many a time at, you know, on the wrong foot. Before someone has, you know, said something, even they just started saying something, I have often presumed that I know what they're going to say. And because I know what they're going to say, I know that I have to set them right straight away. I just interrupt them and go ahead and say my thing. Well, you know, I caught myself doing this and I've been admonished for it many a time. Thing is that you just can't do that. One of the things that one has to learn in, in teamwork is to give space for listening to others. And you know, there is a complimentary thing to listening. Who are you listening to? You're listening to someone else who wants to express themselves. How will someone else express themselves? They will express themselves only when they are feeling comfortable to express themselves. Only when they're feeling that there are many receiving ears, trying to understand what I'm trying to say, All right? So there's a complimentary side to listening. It is to enable the other person to express themselves. And when you haven't understood something, which is quite often, because it's not easy to say exactly what you mean and make sure that others have understood you. You say it, but then you should expect some questions. But what should be the nature of the question? There are two kinds of questions. One is a question which sort of says, ah, what do you know? Ah, you know, a kind of a challenging question. There's another kind of question, which is to say, you know, I really haven't got what you were saying just now. What did you mean by saying this? I have fully understood you. So this is a question that enables the other person to express themselves better. And then through this process of listening and questioning, we begin to really understand each other. And you know, this takes its time. It doesn't happen in a hurry. It requires a lot of patience and a certain attitude of respect for each other. Everybody's on the same level and everybody commands the same respect of all the others. And the last skill set we are talking about here is what's called complementing. You know, in teamwork, this is perhaps the most powerful of skills. Complementing means you suggest an idea and I know I can build on that idea. Ah, you know, you made me think of something else. Can we not do it like this? Can we not make it a little better in this manner. So you keep adding ideas together, multiplying ideas to, together. In other words, building on each other's thought processes. And you know, when 
this process takes off, you'll be amazed how rapidly it grows. It's like, it's like yeast or something that grows organically because it feeds on itself. It's very, it's very powerful. Uh, so these three sets, listening, questioning, complementing, are important skill sets. Next. Hard. Well, we've come together as a team and we're going to be together for, how long is it, Amanda? Another six months before we have to- Yeah, nine have, months actually. Nine months, my God, it's a long time, see? <laughs> so well, what are we going to do over these nine months? There needs to be some kind of a work plan. Of course, the Decathlon team has, has tried to give it structure. You know, they make you begin in a certain way and then they move you along. So they do give you a structure. But reflecting on my own experience of working on projects over a long period of time, uh, these are the some, a few things that I just want to share with you. I've represented the process of working on a design together as a team by this very kind of rough and ready diagram. What you see is at the beginning, there's a lot of diversity of opinion and ideas, a lot of diversity. And when you start communicating with one another and defining your problems better and better, that diversity gradually decreases and you begin to focus on a few selected ideas. So over a period of time, the diversity comes to a point of being able to select and developing a consensus on it. All right, And then when that consensus pretty much develops, you find that you're all aligned. You're all going in the same direction. You're all pursuing the same objectives. And the methodology you've decided on is also well aligned. You're not contradicting one another. You're trying to do one thing, I'm trying to do completely the opposite. Or you're doing thing in one way, I'm doing thing in a totally different way. It won't be productive. So you reach a, a stage of consensus and alignment over time. And this can, you know, it's, it, this is an organic process. You cannot, you cannot do it like a military drill. It takes its time, but you have, to, you have to be sensitive to this possibility. And then over this time, what happens is that the intensity of work grows. You know, when, when you are just sharing lots of opinions and talking to each other, et cetera, you don't feel so intensely about what you're doing. You're just thinking aloud. When tasks get better defined, all right, you have meetings, you see where progress has been made, you define the progress. Each time you meet, you're able to give each other some tasks to do so that when you meet next time, you made some more progress and the tasks are well defined. And the idea is that all this work is designed to reach a reasoned consensus. In other words, we agree uh, because we understand each other. We don't agree simply because, ah, you are the boss, I don't know, but I'm doing whatever you're saying. No, that's not the way of teamwork. You have to agree because of reasoned consensus. If there is a difference of opinion, you have to think deeply and discuss it deeply to get over it. Difficult, but this is part of teamwork. Next. Right. So I've tried to give some names to the beginning processes, okay? Um, and how you reach this position of consensus and then um, how things actually begin to work themselves out over a period of time. Um, so what you find is that the design process is very rarely completely linear. It's not as though, it's not like, like, like writing a, a, a theorem in, in geometry, right? You start in a particular way, you go to the next line, you go to the next line, next line, and the, at, at the end, the last line says QED. There's a linear process that you follow and you reach the end. Design doesn't happen like that. It tends to be 
iterative. In other words, you do something, but you have to you find yourself, you have to go back. You have to take two or three steps back and reconceive, reconstruct what you are thinking of so that you come up with a more satisfactory solution. And that's what iterations are all about. So you do iterations, you come up with an idea, you have it checked out and you say, oh, it's not quite working the way it should, or can it work better? Or something is just going completely wrong. Take two steps back. Don't say we are already committed to this. Take two steps back. See if you can reconfigure it. So that's the new iteration. Check that out once again. And then see what happens when you check that out once again. Are you making improvements? Are you making progress? Usually you are. But the technical checks that you devise are important ones. These are connected to the objectives of the project. The technical checks are connected to the objectives of the project. Okay. You'll see some more terms written here, something called brainstorming, the question of the chicken or egg. Well, when you are talking of the beginning of a process, often what we do is that we brainstorm. We say, okay, here's, generally speaking, this is the project that we are doing. These are its parameters. These are our objectives. We haven't fully, fully, we haven't understood them in great detail yet, but let's see what each one of us can come up with, what ideas, what thoughts we can come up with. And that's called a brainstorm. Lots of ideas bringing, brought together for everyone to share with. And then someone has to make a proposition. Um, you say, who's going to make this proposition? What comes first? Who's going to say the first thing? Well, I'll give you an example of how this can be done a little later. But a beginning with the proposition as to you made. I have to say, you know, I propose that we all go to Kodai Canal for a holiday. Only then can someone say, ah, it's too far, man. Let's, let's go to Shimla instead, all right? But I had to make a proposition for the idea of the, Shim of the Shimla holiday to be brought out. So someone has to make a proposition or some people have to make a proposition. Then there's a comment on it and there are suggestions around it. There's a response to the proposition, uh, to, to all those comments and suggestions. And that proposition is reformulated. Now the trip is not going either to Kodai Canal, nor is it going to Shimla, it's going to Sikkim because that's what we really wanted to do, have a real good adventure. So this is a process that we'll try and portray a little better for you. Next. I'm just giving example of, of a project that we were working on a couple of months back. Um, so I was supposed to be the team leader and we have the team, you know, like all those people that we had in the first list, a lot of people there. So I said, okay, any ideas? Every idea is welcome. And I just put down a few words like this. I said, well, net zero, water balance, rooftop recreation, earth construction, solar trees, there's a random, but some thoughts and ideas which have to do with sustainability, low energy, low carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So I just, so this was like a proposition uh, of ideas which set a lot of minds moving very, very rapidly. Next. And very soon, gosh, I started getting a list. Somebody talked about, oh, volumetric expansion. A building should be such that it could expand vertically or horizontally. What about acoustics? Okay. And what about, because the ground is undulating, let's raise it up on still so that the landscape can flow all the way through. Uh, what about storing in an underground labyrinth, cool air, which we can let out when it is hot outside, hot, hot upstairs, you know? So that's another idea. Then somebody who's working on landscape was talking about a landscape character. Um, and what, what is the character of the, you know, the trees, the selection of the trees, whether they're native or naturalized and so on and so forth. Even how parking lots are actually part of landscape design. Next. And some more ideas. Ah, so sustainable water management with respect to the urban water cycle. My gosh, big idea. Sustainable solid waste management. 
value engineered vehicle movement. Wow, it's a big campus. So vehicular movement has to be value engineered. What kind of vehicle? And you know, what is its impact on carbon emissions? How can we minimize it, et cetera? On cooling, someone comes up with radiant cooling integration. Someone else says, oh, uh, there can be dust, dust storms at times. The inside should be pressurized. So these are all kinds of ideas that are being thrown in uh, at, the, at the beginning of the project, okay? And now we are beginning to see how each person's mind is working and how each idea one person mentions produces two ideas from another person. And we keep collecting them for a while. Next. Then some wise guy comes along and says, oh, let me put all this into a system. And well, you know, it's like putting all the ideas together, putting it into some kind of a system. So he lists out all the spaces in the, in the project and he lists out some of their environmental parameters and he gives each space an environmental parametric value. Okay, what is important, what's not so important, what is desirable. And now they're beginning to get a finer qualitative integrated understanding of so many variables, okay? So this is a movement towards from what you might call a dispersal or a divergent set of thoughts and ideas towards some deeper, how shall I say, systemic understanding of how these ideas relate to one another and how do they fit into a total scheme. Actually a very important stage in teamwork. And you probably find there are two or three people in your team who are very good at this sort of thing. And you have to support them in doing this. Next. Oh, spatial skills, spatial skills. So usually the architects are the ones who have the spatial, spatial skills. So here's, a, here's an idea. Um, we had a project which we had to do and, you know, I thought about it for a while and I said, okay, now, you know, looking at the side, looking at the climate, looking at the requirements, I have an idea, maybe it works like this. I just drew a building with a central courtyard. East, west side has got the services, building with a certain central courtyard. And I just put it out, you know, uh, and I said, it's, it's going to have a roof garden with a solar PV array covering the roof. That was just a kind of a quick idea. I put it out with the team. Next, what happens? Well, parallelly what's been happening is that there's some other members of the team who are actually doing a very detailed analysis of the climate. They're looking at the movement of temperature, the, the sun path, solar intensity, wind movement, humidity, even ground temperatures. They are actually doing this analysis from the available data uh, on the internet and various websites. And they are refining what exactly in terms of climatic response the building needs to do. They were doing this in parallel. While I just came up with a rough idea of you know, how I think the building can work, okay? So it's like making a proposition to which there will now be a systematic response. Next. And then there was uh, another person who said, okay, you know, what do we mean by comfort? Uh, we are using the adapted thermal, thermal comfort model. I think that's what we have also accepted for our decathlon. But what exactly is this wretched thing? You know, how does it work? How does it apply to our location for this building? Someone did a more precise evaluation of that. Next, this is happening in parallel. Now, these are the people who have quantitative and analytical skills, the engineering lot, the scientific lot. They're able to do this very well. We, the spatial guys are not able to do that so, so well. Uh, and my gosh, they made a fantastic discovery. They said in this climate, during the hot season, the air is very dry. And actually, the, um, not only during the hot season, but for many parts of the warm season also, the air is very dry. So there is a fantastic potential 
for evaporative cooling because by evaporating water with very little energy or no energy at all, you can bring down the temperature of the surrounding air down to wet bulb and you'll be within your comfort zone very easily. And this was a major discovery. Again, this is done by the analysts, not by the architect, it's done by the analysts. Next. And then Swati was brilliant at this, you know, she, she just takes, she takes the building that I had proposed, right? And she said, oh, you know, you're totally wrong. You're just totally wrong. Have you seen which way the breeze is blowing? The breeze is blowing in this direction in this season. How are you going to catch this breeze in your design? Impossible. You've got to reconfigure. So she comes up with another kind of configuration. She tests it and shows that it works so much better. So the first design has to be thrown out of the window and that new iteration starts. A new iteration starts, a new set of, you know, you take two steps back, three steps back, reconfigure the building because you now taken into account the benefit of the analytical work that has been done parallelly. Next. And yeah, you can see the building design has changed. And now one is working in greater detail about what happens to the inside of the building. It is the, instead of having a long courtyard in the middle, it has a courtyard to the side. And the courtyard is so oriented so that it catches the breeze when you most need it. Uh, and it gives you this peripheral area from which to catch the breeze. And the windows now have to be designed in such a way that they would actually intercept the breeze and let it flow through the space. Next. So here we are, just an example of how you move from brainstorming, uh, make a proposition, invite comments and analysis, invite suggestions, respond to it, and, you, and a new iteration starts. And maybe this goes on two, three, four times till you find that you're really getting somewhere. Next. Once you are more or less settled on the main directions of the design, finer work takes over. What is the degree of insulation? How much shading should you have? What should be the method of shading on the side where too much sun is shining on it? Um, how big the opening should be for win in the windows so that the breeze can actually flow through. What is the impact of surrounding buildings on the flow of breeze through the building? So as you reach a, some broad conclusions in the design, the analytical work also then begins to reach a finer grain. It looks at this, the specifics of the evolving design and evaluates what further needs to be done. In this case, we were also looking at what's happening on the roof. How the roof is being shaded by the solar PV array. What does it do? And how much energy, solar energy, can you intercept by the solar PV array? And how much of it can be converted to electricity? So what is your solar PV potential? Can you now design a building where the annual consumption of energy for its comfort and internal operation is less than the energy, than the electricity that you can claim from the roof. Can you now design the building? That becomes a challenge. Next. And as I was saying, you start working on the greater details of the building. The windows, the floor to floor heights, the depths of floor spaces, the access to direct sunlight and how to cut out the unwanted sunlight and so on. And the properties, very, very important, the properties of the external envelope, the thermal mass and the insulation. Same for windows. Next. And when you're reaching a broadish configuration of the building, our Simulation man steps in and says, okay, now, you know what? I'm just going to tell you what's happening to the building in the whole year. And he says that, look, if you can make use 
of all the natural ventilation that Swati is promising, if you get it right, if you can make use of the evaporative cooling potential by using cool water by evaporative cooling to take away the heat from your building, if you can do these two things, and if you can then shade the building from the impact of direct sunshine as much as possible, and you can insulate it sufficiently on the roof and on the walls, then you can expect uh, that the overall energy consumption in the year will be so much, gives a number. And he also tells you what is likely to be the month-wise pattern of energy consumption in this simulation chart. And what he discovers is that if you get your passive design right, that means the basic configuration of the building, its walls and roof and windows and shading, its ventilation, etc. if you get that right, then the, the cooling load, or rather the heat that needs to be taken away from the building to remain comfortable, is such that only about seven or 8% of the total cooling load is coming from the outside of the building, okay? Most of the cooling load is being generated by people who are inside the building and the machines, et cetera, that they're using inside the building. And you know we were we were surprised we were we were really surprised we were stunned, um, and well, you know that by passive design you can do so much. That was an amazing revelation for us. But this could this revelation dawned upon us because our man had done this simulation, but he also said, look, this is the theoretical potential. You have to see if you can make it work practically. Will people open the windows when you need to? open them, what will happen at night because of security and because of insects, et cetera, what will happen, who's going to operate the windows and so on and so forth. So he told us what the theoretical potential was, but now we have to work on the practical solution too. Next. And this is when the technical team gets down and the architectural team, everybody gets down and says, okay, now we are going to define very clear goals, quantitative goals, all right? That this is what the uh, envelope is going to be designed for, maximum heat gain of so much. The total building will, uh, will be designed so that for every ton of air conditioning equipment that we provide, you should be able to service 750 to 1,000 square feet of the building. That's the ambition and so on and so forth. So there were certain goals, ambitious, no doubt, ambitious, no doubt, but it was good to have quantitative goals because that's the only way of checking how your building is progressing as it is being designed, okay? And you have these, the team specialists are trying to achieve these goals. Okay, next. Oh, there was something else also came. Because the ventilation became a question because ventilation potential was very good. But someone said, oh, what about pollution? So Swati goes around, she collects data on the air quality experience in the last two years in that part of the city. And she comes and says, ha, 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 look what I found. I found that actually you're in a part of the city where the air is pretty clean. It's not the dirty part of the city. And it's likely to remain clean because it's very green. It's got parks and it's got you know, open spaces, and there's not too much traffic going through it. So we should be able to maximize our potential. So this is about going back and forth. You make a proposition, somebody checks it out, either confirms it, or you have to modify the proposition. Next. And then you go into detailed design, all right? My gosh, windows are a big subject. Shading is a big subject. And they're connected to daylighting inside. And so any number of iterations, once again, are done before the final design for the window is arrived at. Next. And you know, we started with the design on the left-hand side. 
and we end it with the design on the right hand side. See? And this is not just done by you know, someone's opinion, it's actually being tested out by good simulation and good study by somebody who is trained in that. Next. And now it's like you know, splitting hairs. On first sight, I can't even tell what the difference between these pictures is. But when the specialist points out the little differences between them and says, look, this corner is doing a little better in this design, that corner is doing a little worse in the other design. So he says that even making that five centimeter adjustment in the window size, height or width, or the type of frame that you're designing, has a bearing on the distribution of light indoors. And this is what the simulation is showing them. Well, we do rely on the simulation being fairly accurate, of course, but it tells you how sensitive the performance of the building is to small adjustments. I hadn't realized this until the person with the analytical skills was able to point it out to me. Next. Oh, then it comes to looking at the elect electromechanical systems. Now, here is the systems integrator or the energy systems integrator, scientist, engineer, brilliant in innovator, representing what the air cooling system has to do as a diagram. Now this diagram has air coming in, air going out, air circulating through the space, and many devices that come in to cool the space down, right? Various kinds of things. So it's a, it's a diagram of the movement of air, water, and the treatment of air and water on its way. It is just, a, I'd say, it is a system diagram of the air cooling and air conditioning system. It has nothing to do with how it's going to be integrated into the building. It's just a system diagram. And so in that sense, it's theoretical, but the theoretical guy comes to the spatial design guy and says, look, this is my system. How will you integrate this in your building? How will it come together? And so then you have to work together. You have to work together to see how you can bring this system to be accommodated into the structure, the space, and the arrangement of the building itself. Okay, so this is this is a system drawn or, or analyzed in in a software called Transis, uh, and it is also evaluated uh, through some partial analysis of air movement in some of the spaces. But it requires you to actually then translate it into a spatial arrangement. Next. So here's an attempt of converting what's on the left-hand side, a system diagram, into a spatial arrangement diagram. Okay, this equipment is on the roof. This equipment is on each floor. This is how it connects to the distribution in the roof slab and the floor slab and the fresh air system. Now you're beginning to see how the equipment and the flow of water and air gets accommodated in the three dimensions of the building, beginning to see it, okay? And this is quite an interesting task. It's great fun to be able to do it. And a good building design is one that really integrates all the systems into a unity. Next. Very, very interesting analysis that was done. In this particular building, um, a question was raised. We were going to use, uh, RCC slabs cooled by chilled water running through the slabs. Now someone says that what will happen if in the meeting room or in the conference room, suddenly 30 people arrive and it gets too warm. Your system of the chilled slab cannot react to that quickly, can it? Won't they feel uncomfortable? So here's a brilliant idea that's coming from Pierre, who is the who is the systems who is the uh, energy systems integrator. He said, "Oh, you know, I tell you, I tell you what, I got a, I got a brainwave. What's the brainwave? 
we will use ceiling fans that can operate in both directions. They can throw air down or they can throw air up. So when the weather is pleasant and you hardly need any cooling, these ceiling fans throw air down. When you are depending on rapid cooling and you want rapid cooling, we'll switch the fans around so that they throw air against the cool slab. And as they throw air against the cool slab, the rate at which the air picks up the cool from the slab and circulates it to the room increases threefold. And so you get a quick reaction. So very clever device. But you know, this innovation or this idea of innovation arrives only when we are talking together. It doesn't come by itself. It's when you see the configuration of the building, you pose a problem, you think about it, somebody comes up with a, uh, a brainwave. So just an example of how this iterative process uh, and building upon each other's thoughts really produces fantastic results. Next. Okay, so then of course <clears throat> you go further. You say, okay, now we've found out how to integrate the system in the building. Now let's do a let's do a test. Let's see how is this system working in the first three months of the year? How is it working in the hottest months of the year? How is it working during the humid months of the year? And then back to the first three cool months of the year. What what will change and how will the system adapt to the new requirements? And you, so, so you run the system through its annual cycle, okay? And that becomes another layer, another level of testing. Now this testing is all done by engineers and this proposal is all worked out by engineers who have now understood how the building is working, who have now understood what is going on inside the building, who's there, what kind of work they're doing, what is the density of population? They understand the configuration of the building and they now know how their systems interact with the building too. Next. Yeah, so winter, well, you go through this. I, didn't, I need not go through that. Winter, you do one thing, summers, you do another thing and so on and so forth. You can keep, but this is a good test. You know, you look at the building in every season. Next. Well, at the end of the day, we were talking about holistic experience. The folk who are going to come and work in this building, they are not bothered about the details of the technical installation. They are not bothered about the calculations you made. They're just coming there to enjoy the place, right? And you can't forget that. It's got to be an enjoyable place. It's got to be a great place to work in, to be in, uh, to feel that you're a part of a city. So this is the roof garden shaded by the solar PV arrays on the top. Uh, and I can tell you, it is when the clients or the prospective occupants see these images about the kind of place it's going to be with a short comfort and all that, that is when they give the stamp of approval. They don't give the stamp of approval on your calculations only. They are talking about a place which offers them uh, the holistic experience of live and work. Next. Yeah. So now you begin to see the building as it has almost, it's not quite, it's not the final design drawing, but nearly there, begin to see what it's beginning to feel like. It's height, it's relationship with its neighboring spaces, how the courtyard functions, how the roof garden functions, and so on. Next. And then of course, you go into the details of how the indoors works. And this, you know, we're talking about a building culture because it is dependent on people knowing how the building is to be operated, how it is to be used to get the best out of it. It's very important that you have a language and a way of explaining to the prospective occupants how the building 
will function best and how they will enjoy it most. And so whether it is the way the air is going to flow through it, how you will get your cooling, when you can use the ventilation system, how to use it, how the artificial lighting will work, what is the role of ceiling fans, all of these things have to be explained and illustrated for the occupants. For them to feel that yes, this is a building they understand and they know how to live in it. A building that is understood in its function, its behavior, and people who know how to use that building together constitute the culture of the building. Together constitute the culture of the building. And that actually is one of the things this entire decathlon program is about. Next. I need not go into these details. These are, again, iterations. Every second day, the client will come up with new requirements. The boss wants a bigger room. We want one more manager. Uh, this, this room cannot be on this side. It has to be on the other side. So you keep changing the internal layout of the spaces. It's natural. It's going to happen. It's not going, if it's not going to happen today, it's going to happen after five years. Things will change. Organizations will change. So we discovered that we have to design a system which can take care of change over time, change of internal requirements over time. It must be flexible enough. You remember the words robust and resilient? So this is one of the aspects of resilience, to be able to accommodate institutional change. Another is to be accommodate, able to accommodate climate temperature rise, to be prepared for that one and a half, two degrees climate temperature rise and still be able to offer you comfort in the future. Next. Well, I don't think, you know, this, this is the kind of thing, these are the assurances that we give, uh, that you'll have filtered fresh air, that you'll have humidity control, you will have assured high internal uh, environmental quality, you will have ceiling fans that you can control from your desks and so on and so forth. So there are certain things that are built into the building which I explain to the owners and to the occupants. And the hope is, or rather I wouldn't say it's, it's more than a hope, it is a requirement that the building designers and their team hands over to the building occupants and the operators of the building and hold hands, hand, hand holds them for about one year at least so that they can really discover which is the best way to use the building. Um, this is a process which is often forgotten, but is essential. Next. Yeah, so this is where we are. This is how the building is going to look like. Um, one of the things that happened was that people became more and more ambitious and they said, oh, you know what? We are uh, an organization that is involved in renewable energy. Why don't you demonstrate more aspects of renewable energy on your building? And so there are sliding screens that are supposed to be shade screens, which can be adjusted according to the season. But these screens are made out of solar PV panels. All right. So it becomes a kind of a dual purpose sliding screen that's being put in. And so all of this integration of so many ideas eventually produces the net result of the building. Is this the last picture, Amanda? Yes, Ashok, yeah, this is so the last just, <laughs> So let me just say a few concluding words. Uh, first of all, uh, this is going to be the first experience for so many of you and so many of us in working together in teams which have just come together. They bring different skill sets, different experiences. It is important that you all come together and understand each other well. That you have a work plan and that you gather everybody's ideas and that you systematically through an analytical framework, arrive at consensus of the design 
and keep refining it. Keep introducing new ideas and be, never be scared of iterations, going back, two steps back, three steps back, and then four steps forward and five steps forward. Again, two steps back and then forward again. Never be scared of that because that is what makes designs move from strength to strength. Thank you all very much. All right, thanks Ashok. Um, let's take uh, up the questions now. Um, mm. We also have Prasad here. Prasad, you can also add your comments. Um, so yeah, uh, the first question we have here is, um, how to tackle the team problems and how to make teams strong and supporting towards work? Well, I think it's a, it's a good question and it's a question that will always be there, okay? Uh, but I, you know, I believe that somebody out there in the audience has the right answer for that. Is there anybody who wants to give, uh, you know, uh, try an answer? Anybody there? Uh, so oh. unfortunately, we don't. Uh, you don't have that facility. Okay, never mind. Yeah. Never yeah. Mind. Well, but, you know. But I'm sure the participants can, you know, uh, add their comments in the chat box. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm, what, what, you know, I would go back to my our first few slides, where we talked about um, the qualities amongst the participants in a, in teamwork. All right. The first few slides. I would suggest you please go back to those slides, everyone, and look at them. And I think the most crucial one from personal experience are those personal qualities of listening, positive questioning, and complementary thought building, building upon each other's thoughts. These are, in my opinion, the most important personal qualities we need to cultivate. Okay. And I think you can all find, you can all, I mean, I caught myself in this so often, you can all catch yourself when you find yourself interrupting someone else or denying uh, or contradicting someone else without having fully understood what they're saying. You'll catch yourself doing that. So I think these are some personal qualities that are important. It is also useful after you've got to know one another to have somebody, I wouldn't say a leader, but a, a person who is in a position of kind of leadership, you know, somebody who sort of says, okay, let's work this out, let's do it this way. And then people gather around that one person. So if you have a team of five, four, five, six people, or eight people or 10 people, there can be a couple who might take the lead and people should feel comfortable about who is taking the lead, okay? Because the leader has a slightly higher set of responsibilities. They have to be ahead in organization and target setting. When are we going to do what? What is the next step we are going to take? Communicating with everybody, right? and getting the things in motion with good communication because a lot of it is going to be on internet, right? So I think those are the couple of things that I'd like to point out, but I'm sure Prasad has something to add. Actually, somebody sent in a answer in the chat box. Uh, they say, uh, this is Badrinath who says, communication is the key. Yep. How we understand and listen to our team members is one main element for teamwork. And I, I think I agree. Actually, Ashok, when I think back to that slide that you had of diversity versus intensity on the mm. two axes where you had, you know, the earlier stages where um, there's a lot of ideas and a lot of diversity in terms of approaches and then it becomes streamlined towards more of an intensity of work. I, I tend to sort of uh, categorize or, or talk about it in two, two qualities. Um, you already talked about leadership. I think the two, the other kind of the other kind of quality that's important here is facilitator skills. So somebody who is able to make sure everybody is heard and everybody is listened to, and a facilitator's role is important to make sure that the diversity is actually being respected, that people are able to contribute their ideas. And then the leadership role actually is about making sure that action happens as a result of the diversity and the conversations that are going on. 
so these two qualities or these two personalities can be in the same person as a team leader or they can be you know in two separate people who, again who have reasonable amount of authority within the team hmm. so it is possible for example that your team leader is more action oriented to make sure work is being done etc and your faculty advisor or your faculty lead can play the role of a facilitator to make sure all the team members are being heard um, but these two are 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 key to make sure that that transition that ashok showed actually does happen yeah yeah good point yeah right um so let's move on to the next question so we have next question from rohit um so sir during a process a lot of times the group members go through a fallout with each other and don't reconcile readily what should be the strategy of the members in situations where work gets affected because of such fallout go go for a boat ride together okay <laughs> you know uh fallout is a is a symptom of um the ego coming in the way there's it's, there's no such thing as a fallout it's just that we haven't understood each other there's no fallout you know uh and i think it's a symptom of the ego coming in the way uh, one has to be able to say you know ask oneself the question what is it that i disagree about uh and what is it that we disagree upon if i ask myself that question and the other person equally ask herself the same question then we are in a conversation and and i'm quite certain i mean this has been my personal experience over umpteen years that when you engage in deep conversation and really want to understand the other side that you you transcend the differences to come to a higher plane of knowledge and understanding so the conflict if it becomes a fallout is a symptom of ego coming in the way but is also an indicator of things not clearly understood between different parties and it requires work for them to be better understood and it's a lot of patience and hard work and sincere work and it always my experience is it has always led to a better result okay um and i you know if 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 you were to talk to somebody like abdul kalam or you know you will hear him out on you know what it is to lead a team and you know what is a good team leader etc etc uh and how people with so many different skills and ideas and knowledge come together to do very complex very very complex tasks right uh it's not it's very clear it's not about who's dictating terms it is about how they're developing their collective knowledge right i'm sounding idealistic but i can tell you this is true okay yeah so one one comment i have here uh, for the participants is you have to think in layers or in 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 priorities in some sense your your project or your mission of what you're going to be doing is at the highest level of priority the next is the team and the next is the individual so when you have these conflicts if you go back to you know what is our mission what is our, what are we trying to do over here and if you have clearly defined goals or objectives then you can refer back to those and say are we doing the right thing is the conflict a result of trying to reach the goal or is it outside trying to reach the goal if it's to, if it's about reaching the goal then there's a way to address it if it's outside of reaching the goal maybe it needs to be addressed in a different way but if you remember that that's what it is the next step then is the team so how is it affecting the team you you address that and then the next step becomes you know is the individual supported enough to be able to do the work that they need to do to get there 
And if you if you layer it this way, then it be, they, then you have a framework for addressing some of these issues and even anticipating them sometimes. Yeah. Well, I think you know one one major lesson is that it all takes a lot of patience and a lot of sincerity. Without patience and sincerity, don't expect anything at all. You just have to have these two things. Yeah. yeah. Very right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you guys should go for a board, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So is that for Ashok and me? Let him launch. Yeah. So next question we have is from Sayak Banerjee. Um, at what stage should we start to negotiate cost versus systems? Yeah. Actually, you know, we said something about in the objective that it has to be inherently economical, right? Uh, it's easier said than done, right? It's easier said than done. You, uh, at what stage? I, I sort of think this is a knowledge that grows with experience, you know, whether you're moving in an economical way or not in an economical way. It is a knowledge that usually grows with experience. But in, in your kind of situation, uh, you probably, when you are approaching what we call consensus or alignment, it's good to just look at the, the approximate cost implications of the different ideas that are being integrated in the building, right, in your proposition at the beginning of the formulation of the detailed design, you should go through that exercise. That's the right time. Because if you're too far down uh, and you've committed yourself to things which are inherently very expensive, they're already only good for a space shuttle, shuttle, shuttle and not, not good for uh, a simple home, uh, then it's gonna to be too late. So, when you're beginning to formulate the first set of ideas that come together as a building, that's the time to just do a quick cost review. Or I wouldn't even say a cost review, but a kind of, what's the word? What looks expensive and what looks economical. You can't put numbers to it, but you can say this looks expensive, this looks economical. Yeah. So uh, Amanda, I have a question that my to Ashok that may perhaps bring this sort of discussion um, to a different kind of light. Ashok, the project that you were talking about, mm. uh, that that building where you had a central courtyard and then you had the, the C-shaped building eventually happening and all the systems that happened, mm. you had so many different consultants mm. um, or people working on it. Mm. And did you have workshops or what sometimes we call design charrettes mm. at various stages of the project? Mm. And were, was everybody part of it or did you choose to have certain people at certain times? And oh. were costs part of that along with uh, you know, the, the technical and the exploratory and, the, and what you said as the proposition versus the, the critique and all of that? Mm. Actually, um, everybody was in the design charrette workshops when we, this was a competition, all right? So we took about eight weeks over which to develop the design. And we had a workshop every week where everyone was present, okay? Um, for the first, first four to six weeks, everybody was present. Then after that, maybe not everybody was present, but even after having uh, been awarded the work and going into more, more detailed design and rechecking various things, uh, we have been meeting once every week. Um, the the two people who have come, come in and gone out off and on are the um, landscape person and the structural engineer. They've come in and gone out because their parts 
in some ways um, get either fixed or are a layer that can be adjusted very easily, okay? So in the case of the structural engineer, the, their part gets fixed pretty, uh, pretty, pretty well, and then there's very little more that they have to be engaged with. Whereas the others, the environmental planners, the air conditioning people, the plumbing, daylighting, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and of course the spatial designers, two or three of us, they have been meeting every week. They have been meeting every week. And do costs get addressed, you know, from, from time to time during those meetings? Yeah. Now it's like this. Uh, because of the experience of the participants, cost is always implicit in the thinking and ideas. Okay. Hmm. This, um, this is, as I said, on this because of the experience. They just know, oh, we won't go there because, you know, that's going to be costly. We'll, we'll try it this way. Uh, so, can't give you a, a good answer on that one, uh, but we did have to have interim, uh, we had a budget estimate, then we had a project estimate to which we have to be committed, and to that extent, yes, cost was evaluated, but at all times, at every stage, uh, there was a drive for simple, more efficient, less costly solutions. This was really just the, the breadth of experience that a lot of these consultants have. Right, yeah. Thanks, Prasad, and thanks, Ashok. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, so in a time uh, in a sorry, in a team, a lot of times there are few members who are strong in one aspect, and conversely, there are there might be an as, aspect regarding which no one has clue. What needs to be done in such situations? Oh, wow. that's a good point. That means we are a team, but we don't have a fast bowler, right? So what are we going to do about it? Okay, uh, I would say get a fast bowler if you can. If you can uh, identify a crucial knowledge and skill set, which together you say, look, we, we just don't have anybody who can address this. I think it is, it is important that you say, okay, let's, let's find someone, go to your faculty, go to somebody else and say, look, sir, we just don't have the, you know, this part is a weakness in our team. Please help us. Uh, you know, bridge that gap. It's important to bridge that gap because especially if you realize it is critical, okay? If you realize it's critical, fix it there and then, yeah? It, yep. it's, it's amazing, you know, in, some, in, in, a, in a project where we were doing, which was a big campus, a layout thing, all right? Uh, we knew from the very beginning that the person who has to start this work, two people who have to start this work have to be somebody who understands uh, hydrology and water resource management and somebody who understands the ecology of the land. These two people have to be there right at the beginning. Without them, we are lost, right? Because we're dealing with a large chunk of land, which is a sensitive ecology. Uh, so I think when you, when you realize what is needed, get the person. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two ways to get a person. You can find some other student uh, who sort of has an interest or can uh, or already has the expertise. You might find somebody in that college, in a college or, or, or another neighboring institution. Another way is to look for an industry partner who has that kind of expertise. And have one of your team members or one or more of your team members start talking to that industry partner on a regular basis so that the learning in within the team then increases. Mm. Yeah, there have to be ways of supplementing it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we'll take up the next question. Um, hello, sir. Firstly, thank you. It was a very informative way of uh, telling how to form a team. Uh, my question is, since we are working online and we haven't met each other, how do you suggest we start connecting? 
<laughs> Can you go on a virtual boat ride? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question, I tell you. Uh, I don't have a ready answer for that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very funny. Amanda. Yeah. You're a virtual friend. I never met you, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is one example here. This is one example. So yeah. I, th- I, th- I think, you know, with, with internet services the way they are, you know, we can see each other's body language, we can talk and we can, you know, so this, this whole thing of uh, being in the same room and having the space to speak freely, it, you know, some of us will have hesitation. It is, you know, up in front of so many people, what should I say? I'd rather, you know, will I make a fool of myself, et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually very important for the team to make everybody else feel comfortable. All right. And there needs to be, you know, some sort of, what, what, do, they, what, we, what do we call them? Icebreakers, right? So that the stiffness goes away. So I, that's why, that's what, that's my virtual boat ride. My virtual boat ride is an icebreaker. And the stiffness goes away. You begin to see each other. You begin to talk to each other. People talk about their hobbies, what they're interested in, where they've been, where they're living, and all that sort of thing. And so you become you, you become a person who is recognized. And just give it time. I think it's very important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Ashok like, very rightly said uh, first, I think you guys should have like an iceberg session. That's very important. Get to know each other. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah. Uh, anything you want to add, Prasad? Well, I just remember uh, talking to some of the teams from last year that they used to talk about their hobbies. Uh, and then when you know they'd find that somebody was a stand-up comedian or had an interest in their, that, that person would do that. There was somebody who used to play music and they'd play the music. And it was starting starting to get the feel for the person more than just the work itself. Mm. So I think those those are great ideas for getting to know each other better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Holistic experience, right? That's part of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So moving on to the next question. Um, sir, in a teamwork, different students is having different ideas. Uh, due to this, there are so many problems that occurs. How to solve them? Well, at the risk of re- keep repeating myself once again, I would say if you and I have different ideas. I have to understand your ideas in depth and you have to understand my idea in depth. We need to also compare together these ideas and compare them together against, as Prasad said, see what your objective of the project is. See which ideas are moving towards the project, right? And is it that actually, funnily enough, that your idea and my idea are somewhere connected? They're not opposed. Because you've been prompted to your idea because you had that objective in mind. Isn't that so? Same with me. Somewhere there is a connection. Okay? So the difference of opinion and idea is an invitation for deeper discussion. It's not, it, it is not something that you turn away from. Never. That's a rule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ashok. Yeah. Uh, we have an uh, interesting question coming up next. What to do in case it feels like one is being ghosted by their team? <laughs> one is being? Ghosted by their team. Being roasted by the team. Ghosted. 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 What does that mean? Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. I didn't... It's a it's a new term by the new generation. What does it mean? Yeah. <laughs> I'm being ghosted. I can see that. <laughs> like being ignored. <laughs> oh, I see. Being ignored. Yeah, yeah. And you have to say, look, hey, you're ignoring me. <laughs> huh? Hey, 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 you know, I'm here, right? Can you, can you give me a chance? Can we just say, can I say something? 
Um, and, you know, here the mentors and the faculty people are, are a great, great help because a, a faculty person uh, is a person who we expect would be wiser in this sense, um, would be able to spot if someone is being ghosted or not, would be able to spot if somebody is being too domineering or not, and would probably play a role in sorting that out a little bit, you know, so that you can strengthen the teamwork. Uh, if some people are retreating and some people are dominating, teamwork is suffering, that's for sure. Yeah. So I think you can, you can call yourself out and say, look, I'm here. And you may, on the side, uh, have a discussion with the faculty member and say, look, I think we need to do something about it. Can you please help us out? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Ashok. Yeah. Um, so next question we have is, is costs ever been a deal breaker to incorporate or select any innovative proposition? Well, Prasad, what do you say? Has it ever been a deal breaker? Um, well, if you think of it as a breaker, then it becomes a deal breaker. But if you treat cost as a parameter under which you're working and you're mm. conscious of it all the time, mm. then it doesn't become a deal breaker. It's when you ignore cost as a parameter and then come back mm. to it suddenly, that's when it becomes mm. a deal breaker. Mm. Yeah, you know, one hasn't done this business management business uh, thing at all, but uh, we, we're all told about how costs will come down when there's scale. And we're all told about how some costs, some higher costs are perfectly justified because of life cycle benefits and so on. So cost is actually a complex issue. Um, and, but one thing is, one thing is, you know, let, let's, look, let's look at something else. Um, the cheapest um, phone, uh, this, what do you call it, that kind of phone, Android phone, the cheapest Android phone that you can get in the market I don't know what are the prices now. 8,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees, something like that? We even get lower than that, yeah. 6,000 rupees? Yeah, maybe. 6,000 rupees. Okay, let's say 6,000 rupees. That's the cheapest mm -hmm. phone you can get. Um, but the, the, uh, the button phones that are still around that you could get, you know, you could get for 1,500, 800, something like that, right? But you'll find that people um, suddenly jump to the 6,000 rupees phone or an 8,000 rupees phone, okay? It's an expensive solution compared to the previous one, but it offers you a new platform for communication much more powerful than the previous one. So, so cost is therefore a relative matter. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of what that extra cost is making available for you. After that, it's a matter, can anybody actually afford it? So a time came when people earning even 15,000 rupees a month will wait till they can buy that 6,000 rupees phone. It became affordable for them too. So this is a slightly complex thing. So I think just on the question of, you know, Somebody says, I want a solution at 200 rupees and you're finding it's costing 300 rupees to get a much better solution that you thought of. It doesn't mean you should stop innovating there. I think you should go for it. So it's a, it's a bit of a matter of judgment on what you think you're achieving at a slightly higher cost. And usually the person who's asking you to produce something, you know, your, your partner, your, what do you call it? Your project uh, partner. Your project partner you know, will be a baniya, you know, he'll, he'll be asking for the cheapest possible solution you can give, right? And gradually you have to say, look, you know, that's not where the answers lie. The answers lie in an optimal solution, right? And that's the, that's the story you have to build up. Yeah, so uh, that's good, Ashok. I think there will be a webinar on 
uh, cost and affordability, and we'll cover oh, this a little, little bit more detail there. Um, the self-learning module on costing, uh, cost estimation affordability also gives you different ways of justifying costs or, yeah. or justifying value necessary, not just cost. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what Ashok was talking about. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take up the last question. Um, I think this question might probably be for Prasad. Um, so, uh, so hi, sir. You guys are conducting webinars for the competition since its beginning. It's okay. But how could we be able to explain and express ourselves and our design as a team? Will the upcoming meetings will be like, can we can directly ask questions instead of putting questions in the Q&A box? Yeah, I think this is a question for me. Thanks, Amanda. Mm -hmm. So um, the webinars that we're having are intended to show you best practices from experts. And you know, people like Ashok, uh, others who are going to come, they're going to talk about their experiences, how they work on projects, how you should therefore take certain things up. It's not the forum where you would be able to show your design and ask questions directly. For that, we have the technical resource group. These are your individual mentors, or you can talk to them directly. You can send them emails. You can set up meetings with them, and you can discuss your specific design problems and issues with them. So feel free to do that. The technical resource group uh, members they're listed on the website, and I believe they're also on the learning management system of Moodle. So you'll have your uh, you'll have their contact information. You can email them, call them up, etc., and then start reaching out to them. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So that was the last question we had. Um, so thank you, Ashok. Thank you so much. It was a very great session today. Uh, I'm sure all the participants might have, you know, noted down all the powerful skill sets and best practices that they need to carry out uh, while working as a multidisciplinary team uh, throughout this nine months process. Um, yeah. So thank you once again. And thank you to all the participants for joining us today. And um, See you in next week for the next session on energy performance for your building. All the best. All Have the a good best. time. Thanks, Ashok. Thank you. Bye. Bye.